Oh, congregation, family and friends, Bereans, I pray that all is well with you, and I thank you for joining me for this edition of Monday Night Manna. If you have never joined me on these Monday evenings, here's a, a, just a snapshot of what we do here. You know, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, and you read about this in the book of Exodus, we're going to be looking at a portion of this, by the way, tonight. God fed them with water from the rock. He fed them quail when they were asking for meat, but he also fed them with manna. It was a dew-like substance that they found on the ground each day. This was their physical manna that helped sustain them over 40 years in the wilderness. Well, what I try to do on these Monday evenings is give you some spiritual manna, something that we can digest, a bit of spiritual food that we can chew on and digest and think about during the week as we get into the work week. And that's what Monday Night Manna is all about. I've been doing this now for two years, and uh, it's a special time that I like being with all of you. Uh, it's not necessarily a formal Bible study, and it's not a Sunday sermon. It's just a way of sharing a little bit from God's Word as He's opened my eyes to things. But I told you, yesterday, if you were with me for the Sunday broadcast yesterday, I told you that I had something I wanted to share with all of you tonight. So before we do our manna, I want to share an experience that happened. Uh, over this weekend, you, you know, many of us have been in uh, isolation with this COVID-19. But Illinois is currently in phase three out of five phases, which means certain, certain businesses are starting to open up. People are allowed back out a little bit to a degree. And so on Saturday, the weather was beautiful, and, and my wife was getting a little bit of cabin fever, and so Crystal s suggested that we take a drive, a nice drive in the car out into the country. She had a particular town in mind in, in western Illinois that she wanted to visit. So I said, okay, you know, let's do that. The weather's nice. Let's get out of the house for a little while, get some fresh air. I am not going to mention the name of the town. Uh, for for various reasons. It, the town is not important, but it's indicative of what's happening around the country. So here's what we did. We drive out, had a nice ride on the way out, not too much traffic, weather is perfect, sun is shining. We get into this town and we're driving through and it's typical of what you see in a small town. You see some small stores, a few people, a, a few churches, a main restaurant or two. Very quaint little town. We don't see too many people we turn a corner and we're heading down the street and, and we're going slow and coming down the street on our right is this young man with a basketball under his arm. The young man happened to be black. He was a person of color and he's heading towards us. So we pull over in the car and roll down the windows and we engage him in conversation. He looked at me and then he looked at Crystal and he said, wow, you're the second black person in this town. And, you know, Crystal said, well, we don't live here. You know, we're just visiting. We're kind of driving through. And so as we were engaging him in dialogue, he told us this, that he was adopted when he was a child. He was born with drugs in his system, and he was adopted by this woman who lived in this town. She is a white woman. She is well off. She's a business entrepreneur. Uh, we know who she is uh, in a in a uh, not personally, but in a cursory way, we know her business. So we found out, you know, once again, this world is so small. And here's this young man um, who was personable for us and to us. And he's talking to us and telling us about his mother and how he got into this small town. And then he said this. He said, I'm the only black person in this town. He said, and a lot of the residents look out for me. They watch out for me because I've, grow, I've grown up here and there's no one else here that looks like me. That was encouraging to hear. And then he said something that I really want to share with you because this is where I got angry. And this is where I'm still angry at it because this stuff shouldn't be happening. He says to us, he says, I want you to look off to your left. Do you see the, the cop sitting over there, the police officer? And we finally scoped out the police officer, and, and the officer was sitting in, in a parking lot, I guess as many officers do, and they're looking for flow of traffic or speeders or whatever it is that they're doing while they're there. He says, do you see that police officer over there? He says, that police officer has been after me. They're watching me at all times, the police department here, because they think I deal heroin. Now that, I didn't know what to say to that. Here's this young man, has no appearance of being a drug dealer, has no appearance. He's carrying a basketball, young, healthy man who was telling us where he went to school and what he does for a living and all of these things. And because he is black, 
Because he's a person of color, the police already have it in for him. The police already think that he's a drug dealer. The police already think that he's doing something bad simply because his skin color is darker than mine. Well, I look over at my wife and I look at my wife Crystal and her skin tone is the same as this young man's. And now we're thinking, you know, we were looking at this town as a potential place to go ahead and move to since, you know, we all know that I resigned my position at Grace Church and we're moving on with our life and we're just looking around to see where the Lord may have us to go. Well, you can imagine that this town is now off the list. There's not a chance in the world that I would dr bring my wife and have a relationship with any of those people in that town if that's the way they look. Now, the, the residents themselves, he said, were nice people. But if you think for a minute, I'm going to take my wife and myself into a town where the police are already against people of color based on what this young man said, and they're already eyeballing him up as a potential criminal simply because he looks different than me, we could forget about that town. And it ticked me off, and it still does. This is what this is what we're discovering, and I'm discovering, as systemic racism. This is overt racism. This is racial profiling. This is looking at someone and saying, you must be a bad person because you don't look like me. Your skin is dark. Your people are bad. You people are criminals. And so I'm going to keep following you and watching you until you do something wrong, and then I'm going to bust you. Well, that ticked me off. We said goodbye to the young man. We wished him well. We may have said a prayer with him. I, I honestly don't recall. I was so angry. And I said to Crystal, I said, let's, let's just get out of here. Let's just turn this thing around and get out of this town. I don't even want to be here because it's not right. But we wish this young man well, and we hope that he will not be uh, busted for something he didn't do. Man, is that symptomatic of what's going on? Am I saying... All police officers are like that? Of course not. Am I saying that every single person that they suspect is a criminal is indeed a criminal? I'm not saying that either. I'm saying in this particular case, this was a microcosm of what we see in a bigger picture that's going on all around this country and even all around the world. Certain people, certain colors, certain cultures are held lower than other people. That's, that is a fact. And the more I become aware of it, the more, I guess the, the old Thomas wouldn't have seen that or understood what this young man said to the point that I did on Saturday. Terrible situation. And I'm still mad about it. And I have to take that anger to God because I'm not supposed to be holding anger and, and so on like that. We're not supposed to be like that. But man, that was just totally unfair. It never should have happened. And I pray that that young man is covered in the blood of Jesus and I pray that nothing happens to him that is unjust or against the law or he's the next victim we see on the news because the officers have it in for him. Now I didn't go a chance to talk to the officer. Now here's the last thing and then I'll, we'll get to our manna tonight. Here's the final thing. Because we rolled down our window and he's leaning into our car as he's talking to us and he's shaking our hands Suppose that police officer, because they suspected him of being a drug dealer, would have come across the street with his lights flashing and would have gotten Crystal and I out of our car and put us all up against the car and frisked us, frisked us because they suspect he's a drug dealer. Now we pull over. It's a strange car in a strange town with a white guy and a black woman talking to the black man that they suspect is the drug dealer. And what would have happened if we had gotten thrown out of the car. We may not be here today. My wife might not be here today. That young man might not be here today because the cops would have assumed something that maybe he was making a drug deal with us because we were a strange car that pulled over to the side and he's leaning in the window. Very likely maybe making a drug deal. He was simply shaking our hands and wishing us well as we were wishing him well. But you see what happens when you start thinking wrong. That could have been a disaster for all of us. Oh, I may have survived. My wife may not have. And this young man certainly may not have. It's just an ugly situation. And we need to stand against something like that. That kind of stuff shouldn't be happening. And uh, yes, I'm angry about it. 
But I wanted to share that with you because those of you who follow me and have watched my evolution in the Word and my preaching over the years, you see that it's getting more and more bold all the time. I'm getting louder because I know that God has given me a voice and I'm going to use that voice and the knowledge that I have to stand for what is right. And that's what led to my separating from Grace Church a week and a half ago. Because I stood for what was right. And as a result, here we are. Okay. I'm off my soapbox now. If you have your Bibles with you, and I sure hope you do, for Monday Night Manor, you always know we go into the Bible. We're going to be in Exodus 14. We're going to look at that for a few minutes. In Exodus chapter 14, if you're taking notes, we are in the part of the story now where the Israelites are out of Egypt. Moses has led them out. And we're going to be looking at a part of the story where suddenly they look behind them because Pharaoh had changed his mind and he gathered his soldiers and he had 600 chariots. And you know that famous scene where the, the Egyptians are now running and coming after the Israelites. They suddenly want the people back. He let them go, now they're back. And I want you to see what some of their reaction of the people is. Now they just saw, the people just saw more than one miracle. They were led out of Egypt. The, the Red Sea has parted. The sea is about to be divided in front of them. But right now, they're up against where this water is and they can't see a way out. Now here's what happens here. All right, it says here, and I, and I encourage you to read all of Exodus 14 tonight to get the entire story here, okay? But Pharaoh comes after them and it says here in verse 6 of Exodus 14, he made his chariot ready and took his people with him. He took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over all over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. The Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army. They overtook them, camping by the sea. And Pharaoh drew near. The sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Okay? That's the first thing they did. But look what they do to Moses. Then, in verse 11, Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die here in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in bondage and my ancestors have been in bondage and I have a way out of Egypt, and I happen to be in the wilderness, I don't think the first thought on my mind would be, why did you bring us out here to die? Now I understand. The Egyptians are following them. They've just been ruled over over 400 years by these Egyptians, and now they see the army coming, and you have this ragtag bunch of Israelites that are at the edge of the water. It doesn't seem like they can go forward. And now they cry out to the Lord first, and we don't know exactly what they say to the Lord, but we just read the questions that they asked Moses. Why would you deal with us this way? They, what they don't understand is that God is dealing with them in that way. Moses was just the spokesman. Moses was the person that God used to go in to talk with Pharaoh. But Moses himself did not let the people out. God let the people out. And so they're questioning the wrong person. They're saying to Moses, Do you, because there's no graves in Egypt, so you brought us out here in the wilderness and we're going to die out here. Are you serious? We would have been better off back there. Now look, they continue with this. Here's verse 12. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Didn't we say that to you, Moses? You didn't listen to us. And then they continue in verse 12. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Now I ask you, if you were in that position, would it have been better for you to spend the rest of your life and maybe even your children's life in bondage to the Egyptians rather than take a chance of freedom in the wilderness? It's because they did not focus, and we see this throughout their wilderness journey, they, kept, they didn't focus on God even though he was right there with them. It said at the end of chapter 13, he was there in a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. He never left them. But every time we turn around, we see this stiff-necked people suddenly saying, blaming Moses. And this goes on again and again throughout the wilderness. No wonder God left them in the wilderness for 40 years to die out there. 
because they're all, it's already a harbinger of what's going to happen. They're already saying, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. God didn't do it out of vindictiveness. He did it because of the hardness of their hearts and they didn't accept or believe what he was doing. And so they're bombing Moses. Poor Moses with all these questions. How many times do we read that the people just came up against Moses and he has to go to God and say, God, what is with these people? And a couple of times he actually pleaded for God not to destroy the people and wipe them out. They should have been glad that Moses was leading them. And yet they ask these questions over and over. You brought us out here to die. We would have been better off staying in Egypt. Now you got us out here and now what? But I want you to see Moses' answer because Moses was a man tuned into God. He understood what he was doing. Listen to this, verse 13 of Exodus 14. But Moses said to the people, this was his response when the people were lobbing all these questions and accusations at him. Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see again forever. Wow! Is that a complete turnaround from what the people are saying? They see the army coming. They see the Egyptians coming to capture them. And all they can see is what their eyes are seeing right in front of them. You have us in the wilderness. We're going to die out here. We would have been better going back with the Egyptians and never leaving to begin with. And Moses says a couple of things to me. He says, first of all, don't fear. Fear is a paralyzing emotion. Fear is a normal human emotion, but it is also an emotion that can trap us into not doing anything. It freezes us. It stops us from thinking logically. We're fearful. Suddenly we're afraid to do anything or say anything or go anywhere. These people were afraid. And Moses is trying to encourage them by saying, don't be afraid. Stand by and watch what the Lord is going to do. That should have been a tremendous encouragement to them. The Lord had already done enough with the pillar of cloud and leading them out. And if you read further into Exodus 14 is when he divides the sea and they cross over. And then they watch all the Egyptians get flooded out. God was about to work on their behalf. But until they could see that, until they could believe that the way Moses did, they were going to live in this fear. And so Moses says again, he says, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Not anyone else. He's going to accomplish it for you. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. And then look at verse 14 is what I really want to tell you about. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Whoa! Now listen, let's think about that. The Lord is going to fight for you while you keep silent. Was Moses in his own way rebuking the people by saying, would you please shut up? Would you please stop bombarding me with these questions? Would you please stop asking me why we're out here in the wilderness and that we're going to die and you're blaming God for this and you're blaming me for this? Just be quiet. Stand by, shut your mouth, and watch what God is going to do. And my question to you is, as I often ask myself, how many times have we start running our mouth about something? How many times we just have to get the last word in? We're pleading with God or we're complaining to God or maybe we're complaining to each other. Oh, God didn't answer this prayer or God didn't do this for me. Or, and we, we forget to be silent. I looked at these verses today and the Holy Spirit just jumped all over me and said, Hey, buddy, you better pay attention to this. This is real. This is the real deal here. You better stand back, Thomas. You better stand back and watch the Lord work on your behalf. Watch what he's going to do in your life. Watch what he's going to do in Crystal's life. Watch what he's going to do with your future ministry. Yes, I know it looks bleak now. Yes, I know you had to take a stand for something and as a result you've lost almost everything. But you be silent and let me fight for you. That's what I want to share with you today because that was the encouragement that I received from the Holy Spirit today. Exodus 14, verse 14. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. See, there comes a point where we can, we can make our requests known to God. And Philippians 4 tells us that. Make our requests known to God with thanksgiving. 
And we can tell God what's on our mind and what, what we're hurting with and what our prayer requests are. We can do all of that. But there is a time that we just need to be quiet, be silent before God. Just be quiet before God and let him work some things out. We live in this world that constantly hustle and bustle. And as I said, now that Illinois is starting to open up and other states around us have opened up even further than us, the roads are getting crowded again. Horns are starting to beep again. We experience that. You go out and suddenly a mall that was closed a month ago suddenly has cars everywhere. We live in a world that is constantly in a hurry. We always got to get to the next destination. Whatever happened to taking things slow? Whatever happened to just being silent or being quiet? Those of you who know me know that I need quiet time. In the morning I have an hour, me and the Lord alone in the Word. First hour of the morning. But at night I also have quiet time as I'm ramping down from the busy day. I need the quiet time. Very often that's the time that God will impress things on me. Sometimes when I'm out walking, it's quiet. There's nobody around me. I'm walking alone. The Lord will talk to me. There are times that we need to be silent. There are times that we need to keep our mouth shut and just listen to what God is telling us. Because if we're constantly listening to the voices around us and the noise around us and we get on that treadmill of life, and it's happened to me, when, when those times happen, it's very difficult to hear from God. It's difficult for me, for him to cut through all of the chatter, all of the nonsense, all of the noise in the televisions and the radios and the phones and the horns blaring and the traffic and all the things that we face in this world. It's hard to hear from the Lord sometimes. Now you know as Exodus 14 goes on and I encourage you, like I said, to read the rest of it. The, the Israelites actually, the sea parted they crossed over. You know this story. And then they turned around and they watched the Egyptians coming across on that same dry land. And what happened? When they got into the middle of it, God brought the water over them. Not one of them was alive. Listen to this. This is the last time they saw them. In verse 30 of Exodus 14, it says this. Then the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. How about that? Now they finally fear the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Oh, only after they saw yet another miracle. After they saw all of the Egyptians, all those people that wanted to bring them back to Egypt, after they saw all of the army dead, only then, did they fear the Lord. Only then did they believe God and only then did they believe in his servant Moses. Are you serious? Are we guilty of that? Do we only believe God? Do we only believe that he's working in our life when we see something miraculous? Or when we get some one of our needs met? Suppose, what about those times that we're praying on things and God doesn't seem to be answering? When we're praying on something and God doesn't seem to give us clear direction, do we still fear God? Do we still hold him up in respect? Do we still have reverence for God? Do we still believe in his word? Or do we waffle back and forth? Do we say, well, God, I, you're not answering me. You must not care about me. That was the Israelites' problem. Moses, you don't care about us. We're going to die out here. Thanks a lot, buddy. Thanks for bringing us out here so that we can die. Only after God performed this tremendous miracle did they finally see it and get it through their heads that God was with them the whole time. God never left them. God still hasn't left his people. He's still listening. But sometimes you and I need to just be quiet. So that's it. That's the manner for tonight. Plain and simple. Sometimes, just be silent before God and listen to what God is telling you. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Just shut up sometimes. That's it. I pray that this man has blessed you tonight. It blessed me today when I read this passage. I thought, man, this is, I've got to bring this out tonight. If this has blessed you tonight, 
Isaiah 55, 11 tells us that God's word does not return void. It reaches all those people he intended to reach. So if it reached you tonight, if you heard this tonight, if this reached you, if this ministered to you tonight, then this word was for you. All that I ask is that you take this and share it with someone else who needs that encouragement. Maybe someone else who's on that treadmill of life and they can't hear from God. They're not hearing from the Lord. They're too busy with other things. Maybe they just need an encouraging message here that they just need to be quiet and stand back and let the Lord do something in their life. So I pray that you would share this message as the, as the Holy Spirit leads you. I also encourage you Bereans, you know this, that's why I said read all of Exodus 14. Just don't take what I say, you need to go into scripture and study it for yourself. That's what being a Berean is all about. Acts 17.11 says that brands were more noble than all others. They didn't have an advantage over anyone else. What they did was, the Bible says that they received the word, just like you heard it. They received the word with all eagerness and readiness. They were ready. But then they took it a step further. The Bible then says that they searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they were hearing was true. You need to do that. The same way that I need to do that. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures every day to make sure what you are hearing whether it's me another preacher someone on 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 any of these social media platforms someone on christian television radio wherever you are being fed the word or attending a bible study you make sure that what you're hearing is the truth because there's a lot of things being preached and taught that's simply not the truth and you better be a diligent berean lastly i want to thank you all for who've been praying for this ministry and for me um, the last 10 days or so have certainly been a challenge as we're moving on to the next phase of our life. We thank you for everyone. I've tried to reach out to all of you and many of you uh, I haven't talked to in a while. Many of you, we've had dialogue already. You and I have been talking and, and praying and, and seeking. And many of you have been so encouraging in where this ministry should go and, and uh, watching out for us. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you also for those who have been supporting the ministry financially lately. As you know, we, we went down to zero income. So this has always been a walk of faith, but now it really is a walk of faith. Because, uh, you know, when you leave a position, you leave the salary behind. So God will provide. We know that. God will give us wisdom. We know one town he's not taking us to. <laughs> That's for sure. There's one town we won't be moving to. Um, but thank you. If you want to contribute to our ministry, if you feel led of God, uh, you'll notice here at the top of the broadcast there's a PayPal address you can click right on that and if you are more comfortable sending something in you can do that also but you don't have to give anything at all that's not what this ministry is all about only if you feel led of God to do that and you want to help us in our stand in what we stand for as far as scriptures and now getting into social justice issues and systemic racism and, and talking more about that. We're going to be doing other things with this ministry. Uh, I haven't shared everything with you yet, but there's other things coming down the pike that we are talking about, that we are developing as we speak. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about that, and I hope you're going to stick around with us for the long haul, because there are